from WAMU 88.5 at American University in Washington. Welcome to the Kojo Nandi Show, connecting your neighborhood with the world. Baltimore-based filmmaker John Waters is best known for breaking taboos and assaulting audiences with outrageous characters and, well, sheer camp. He became a cult favorite with films like Pink Flamingos and Female Trouble. His 1998 film Hairspray tapped a broader audience and went on to become a hit Broadway musical and later a family-friendly movie with an all-star cast. But John Waters has never been completely comfortable in the mainstream fold. Two years ago, he took a chance on another kind of, if you will, transgression, hitchhiking from his Baltimore home to San Francisco. His latest book chronicles his cross-country journey and the encounters real and imagined on the road. Joining us in studio is John Waters, filmmaker, actor, best-selling author. He is best known for the film and Broadway musical Hairspray, as well as movies like Serial Mom and Pink Flamingos. His most recent book is Carsick, John Waters' Hitchhikes Across America. John Waters, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. And I actually had a car today. I didn't have to hitchhike. From Baltimore to Washington would be hard, I bet. You drove from Baltimore today, really? No, hard. I flew. I took the train. Oh, you took the train? From New York. Oh, okay. But hitchhiking, even when I was young and I hitchhiked all the time, I don't think I ever hitchhiked to Washington from Baltimore or back. It, I think it would be very difficult. Why? Well, because Baltimore Washington Expressway is dangerous. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be standing on the... They're all drunk. Yeah. I, I wouldn't want to be standing on the side of the road there with my thumb out. People swerve over at you. I think I agree with you on that. If you'd like to join this conversation with John Waters, call us at 800-433-8850. You can go to our website, kojoshow.org, and watch the live video stream of the conversation. You can send us an email to kojo.wamu.org or shoot us a tweet. At Kojo Show, you are famously a control freak. Why would you put yourself in a situation where you had no idea what would happen next? Well, because to give it up, it was my midlife crisis. Let's see. You know, I'm so organized. My life is so scheduled that I wanted to see what, what could happen if I just gave it up. It scared me. I wanted to give myself an adventure that I was kind of reluctant to take. It's somewhat ironic. You set out on this cross-country hitchhiking journey hoping for the best, but of course the worst experiences would naturally make the best stories for the book. Were you conflicted about what you might encounter? Well, that's why I wrote the first two parts of the book, which is me imagining the 15 very best rides, which are sexual, dramatic, ridiculous, and the 15 very worst, which is where I die in the end, really. So I had imagined so much before I went that I didn't really know what to expect when I left. And what I left, what I found out, was very unextreme people that were from middle America, a world that most of my characters are never about. And when I wrote The Best and the Worst, they were nobody was from middle America, and then how great they were, and how interesting they were, and how completely open-minded they were to any ideas, and completely unimpressed that you were in show business, if they even believed you were. What makes you unique is that you could first imagine the worst, and then nevertheless go out and do the trip anyway. Well, imagining the worst was fun, the same way I like <laughs> villains, you know, imagining all sorts of horrible stuff that can happen to you. And my best and worst, you know, my assistant, one of them said... I don't know. I can't tell the difference between the best and the worst <laughs> because your best is the worst to me. You hitchhiked regularly as a teenager. It's my understanding that your mother expected you to hitch a ride home from school, but times have changed. What's hitchhiking like now? The only thing, it hasn't changed. The only thing difference is, is that there aren't any other hitchhikers. They used to have to fight for a corner in the 60s. But today, I saw one the whole way. I didn't see any other hitchhikers. And one time, a homeless guy came up to where I was standing, and I thought, oh, it's another hitchhiker. I got very territorial. But then he said, hi. And I thought, you know what? That was the only person that spoke to me all day in this community. Hi, I said right back. Nobody was very friendly to a hitchhiker because they thought I was a homeless person bumming money, really, because I had a cardboard sign. And believe me, hitchhiking. You don't look good when you're hitchhiking. It's a, not a beauty regimen. I want to jump ahead here because yeah. you mentioned looking like a homeless person bumming money. You are an actor, yet you fail to convince a grandfatherly man who gave you a ride during the real trip that you are 
who you are. Because I didn't care. I didn't. If they didn't believe me, that was fine. I have to give. I do interviews about myself all the time. When I'm going across the country, I wanted to hear their story. I didn't want to hear mine. If if I did talk when people wanted to. And it was like phone sex. The more you talk, the longer they take you. And sometimes they'll take you way longer than you were going to. They'll take you to the other side of a city, which is what you always want. Not right before the city, because then they're all local rides, which are your enemy when you're hitchhiking, a local ride. Are you compelled to make conversation when someone gives you a ride? Is Certainly. that one of the rules of being well, What would it be like if you got in a car when someone was hitchhiking and they, said, and they didn't talk? It would be really scary if, they, if you said something, please don't talk to me. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> Your job is to talk and to listen. And there, there are rules, I think, of politeness hitchhiking. The radio was never on. I never got in a car where the radio was on, even though I imagined an entire playlist in the fictional parts of song for each rider. Because when you're people picking up hitchhiking, they want to talk. They, they want to. It's, it's an improv session in a way. It is being an actor. Because at first, everybody's acting a little bit themselves to not scare the other person. I think that's the first rule. Don't scare them. And that kindly, grandfatherly man offered you ten dollars he did which took my <laughs> took my breath away when he took out his wallet and he let me off and it was pouring rain and he let me off in an entrance ramp and i didn't I, I didn't know what he meant when he handed me the money i was so stupefied i didn't even know what he was trying to do and then i realized that i was so touched by it and i wouldn't take it but later another woman would not leave the ramp until i took the twenty dollars and then i passed it on to another traveler our guest is John Waters, filmmaker, actor, best-selling author. His most recent book is called Carsick, John Waters Hitchhikes Across America. It's a really fun read. You can join the conversation. Give us a call at 800-433-8850 or send email to kojo at wamu.org. You can go to our website, kojoshow.org, and catch the live video stream there. One of my favorites from your imagined worst-that-could-happen scenarios was a fictional ride with an individual named Adam, who is, in fact... A fan, well, maybe even more than a fan, but not the kind you would like to meet. Can you read a little bit from page sure. 120? And let me set it up by saying, I love my fans. They bought me this outfit. They helped me pay for my house. They, you know, <laughs> when people say, come over to me and say, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you do a cell phone picture, I always say yes. But there's every once in a while, there is a fan that is too much of a fan, and they won't let it go. And so this is my imagined ride. It's a fictional piece of something that I would fear happening to me. Correct. All right. Taffy Davenport, he yells, and it only takes me a second to realize he's reciting dialogue from one of my movies. Thanks for stopping, I say, jumping in and happily buckling my seatbelt to the sound of Hitchin' and Hikin' by Johnny C. playing on his CD player. Great. A country song that laments a failed hitchhiking journey. Just what I don't feel like singing along with. There are two kinds of people, Miss Sandstone. My kind of people and anuses, he answers, mimicking Mink Stoll's delivery from Pink Flamingos. Can you take me somewhere near I-70 West, I beg? Oh, meeting somebody? Who? He answers in a faux rage, repeating another line from my movie so obscure that even I can't place it at first. Okay, I answer, realizing this fan won't quit. Just l let me off somewhere going west. Going to a gangbang or something, he responds, this time channeling David Lockery. No, just a road trip, I answer, refusing to play along with his little dialogue game. I mean, I'm flattered he knows the lines this well, but geez, give it a break. We were just wondering, he continues in character, where you were planning to spread your VD today. That's all hussy. He shrieks with laughter, and I just sit there in stupefied silence. My cheek hurts. I pull his rearview mirror over and see the bruising already coloring one side of my face. Beauty, beauty, look at you, he mumbles, just as Paul Swift did, fumbling his lines in female trouble. I wish to God I had it too. He sees me wince in pain at the cut on my leg and switches to a whole other monologue. I love the taste of it, he rants like divine, the taste of hot, freshly killed blood. Suddenly he grabs back the mirror to his side of the car and takes an exit I'm sure I don't want. Hey, I yell, I told you, I need to go west. You know I hate nature, he answers, again switching film references, this time to Desperate Living. Look at those disgusting trees, he quotes Mink Stoll's character, Peggy Graffle, stealing my auction. Let me off, I shout in panic, but he just speeds up. All natural forests should be turned into housing developments, he screeches, still in mink mode, as he swerves into a driveway of a suburban home and slams on the brake. I wish I could stuff my whole head in your mouth and let you suck out my eyeballs. <laughs> he growls in a piss-poor imitation of Turkey Joe's line in Desperate Living. Dialogue that I used to be proud of, and now curse the day I wrote it. 
John Waters reading from Karsik. It is his latest book. It's called Karsik, John Waters, Hitchhikes Across America. A crazed fan who tortures you by speaking only in dialogue yeah. from your films. Is this maybe revenge for all those you've offended over the years? Maybe. I've had people do that. It happens sometimes when I, I go to a college appearance and I get out of the car and the woman that's picking up has drawn on my mustache. That happens a lot. I'm fine with that. And I have people that have said the first couple lines in dialogue, but this is my nightmare. They won't quit, and they won't stop. And, and there are fans sometimes that are insane. They go over the top, and, and this one gets worse. This is just the beginning of that scene. It gets much worse. Have you ever written dialogue or said lines and playing parts that people came up to you with and you simply couldn't remember at all? Oh, it happens all the time. Uh, I had a girl that I walked down the street in New York, walked past her, and she said, I'm glad I got an abortion. I thought, oh, my God, why did that girl say that to me? And, I'm walking, and then I was, oh, wait a minute. You wrote that line. It's in polyester. Thank you. It's so nice meeting you. <laughs> I remember interviewing the late Maya Angelou sometime in the 1980s and showing her a clip from a play in which she was performing. And she watched it for about three minutes. And at the end of it, she said, I have no idea where that came from. I have no <laughs> memory of it whatsoever. Well, I've written things that, are, that come back and they haunt you and say, did I really say that? You know. Uh, so, But yes, once you write something down, it's there forever. And now on the internet, believe me, it never goes away. It never goes away. Here's Steve on the phone in Vienna, Virginia. Steve, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hey, this reminded me of uh, <clears throat> two situations. One is the more recent one, if you remember the movie Inside Lewin Davis. And uh, that was a long... Uh, uh, a long car trip. But yeah, but a hitchhiking time. scene, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but a lot of, yeah, that reminded me of it, but when I was in high school, which was 64 to 68, I hitchhiked every day with my brother. We went to a Jesuit high school, and it was in St. Louis, so it was from one end of uh, Forest Park to the other end. And so when I went to college, I, it was just like second nature to me. I kind of figured, well, the way I'm going to get back home, which was, by that time was in Dayton, was by hitchhiking. So, uh, so I had a few adventures, but the, the most prominent one I remember is I got picked up. I was going back to school. got picked up by a couple of guys uh, who looked like James Dean. That's all I can say. Is they, right. they had, like, cigarettes uh, rolled up in their... Uh, Boy, I wish that had happened to me. <laughs> oh, it was, it was amazing. And, and these guys were, all I can describe them as is, uh, you know, rebel without a cause. They were... We went through Indianapolis, I remember, right after a snowstorm, and the big sport was... Uh, looking for people who are waiting at a bus stop or something and spraying them in oh. a puddle. And, uh, and then we got up by, uh, you know, whatever the, the ring road, uh, 294 or something like that around Chicago. And they didn't pay for one toll. They would just draft in behind somebody and just barrel right on through. I always yeah. had that fantasy of just smashing the <laughs> gate, too, of when the gate comes out, just smashing through it and see what happens, but I've never done it. That's a great fantasy, and Steve, thank you for sharing that experience. <laughs> well, I don't think it was a fantasy. I think it was real, he was saying. Oh, he, it was real yeah. in his case, and My in fantasy. your case, yeah. it was also we was hitchhiking, hitchhiking just about every day from school. Well, I, just what he did. In Catholic school and private school, always the parents said it was fine to hitchhike. The same perverts were out there picking you up. It was no difference. I guess there were serial killers then, too, but you just didn't seem to hear about it. There weren't as many movies that had the villains and all the hideous stuff that happens in movies about hitchhiking. It's never good. Hey, Steve, again, thank you for your call. You too can call us, 800-433-8850. Are you a John Waters fan? What's your favorite John Waters film? 800-433-8850. You can send email to kojo.wamu.org. John, your very first real ride surprises you. A woman with a baby in the car. What kind of people pick up hitchhikers these days? Well, she did recognize me, yeah. but it, I had been standing in the rain for about 45 minutes a block from my house. <laughs> and she was taking her little daughter to the back to daycare center. And she was just felt so bad she couldn't take me further. Double, she did a double take when she realized yeah. it was you. Yeah. And the next one was a minister's wife who picked me up. But a trucker picked me up, a cop, uh, an independent rock band. Uh, all types picked me up. An animal rescuer, uh, a Republican elected official, a Republican mayor. Uh, you know, I had Democrats, Republicans. There was no real type. Everybody said, oh, a woman will never pick you up. This will never pick you up. But generally, I would say mostly it was heterosexual men that bragged how much they loved their wife and how smart she was and how beautiful, which is was very encouraging. About 80% of Americans recognize you when you just walk around. What In airports, not airport. on the highway, because, first of all, I, to ask about that. I had a hat on, which I never wear. Um, 
people went by me and said, well, was that John Waters? But why would it be me standing in Bonner Springs, Kansas on the freeway? So they would come back sometimes and, and, and pick me up or open the door and say, where are you from? And I'd say Baltimore. And then they'd know and start laughing and cheering. Um, but one woman who was an ex-Marine, she was great. She pulled over and uh, tried to give me money and then realized it was me and started screaming and laughing. And then she was trying to change costumes in the car while she was driving so we could do a photo op. And she took me 50 miles further. She was just going home. She was going one exit on the to, to drop me off at a good place to hitchhike. More about Baltimore later in the broadcast. There were also points in this journey where you say you needed to be unfamous. Can you talk about how you navigated that kind of doublet sort well, of a celebrity? I said I wanted to be unfamous until I was stuck. <laughs> and as soon as I was stuck, I was featuring heavy mustache. I, you know, I was praying that I would go in the breakfast room and somebody would, in the Holiday Inn and somebody would recognize me and give me a ride. That never happened. Um, people were very unfriendly in the breakfast rooms. Uh, I don't know why. Because I had my sign out. And, and one holiday and the woman told me if I didn't leave, she would call the police. And another time, I, my sign was ruined from the rain so I went in the store and said can I use some cardboard and she and said you know it's illegal to hitchhike on the freeway and I thought you yeah but then she very condescendingly let me go in the back where the shed was and rip up boxes to me you were not the most deft person with the cardboard no I'm really bad at doing things like that <laughs> not everybody can write a movie I can't break down a box I'm telling you I cut myself from one of the staples it makes two of us yeah I can't do it there's some <laughs> when I have to plug something in I start crying We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll resume our conversation with John Waters. His latest book is called Karsik, John Waters' Hitchhikes Across America. 800-433-8850 is our number. Have you ever hit, hitchhiked or picked up a hitchhiker? What was your experience? 800-433-8850. I'm Kojo Nam. Never, never, never gonna speed again. Slip the blood to me, bud. I jump in my rod about a quarter to nine. I gotta make a date with that chick of mine. I cross the center line, man, you gotta make time. <laughs> transfusion, transfusion, oh man, I got the cotton pick. Welcome back. Our guest is John Waters, filmmaker, actor, best-selling author, best known for the film and Broadway musical Hairspray, as well as movies like Serial Mom and, of course, Pink Flamingos. His most recent book is Karsik, John Waters' Hitchhikes Across America. There's a chapter here where a cop mistakes you for another celebrity. It's in the fictional section of the book. But I'm assuming that most, like most celebrities, this actually happens to you. It happens to me a lot where people I'm on a plane and the flight attendant will lean down and say, you were good in Fargo. <laughs> so, Steve Buscemi. So, this is an old joke. So, I told Steve Buscemi this and he said, they think I'm Don Knotts. And, and one year, my Christmas card was Steve dressed as me. And it really <laughs> confused people. Because he's younger, and it did. I mean, they drew the mustache on him and everything, and it was, it was a funny card, you know. So Steve is, um, we're certainly friends, but he's uh, scary now in Boardwalk, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's great. <laughs> you got picked up by a young Tea Party Republican from Frederick County, not far from here, and he gives you a ride not once 
but twice. Can you tell the story of meeting the Corvette kid? It was pouring rain. I'm in Millersville. Where you say it's not so far from here. It's not that close. And I had never been there. So I was, when you really feel like you're hitchhiking, it's when you don't know where you are, where you're standing, which I didn't. I was standing in the pouring rain, looking like junky Mary Poppins, and a Corvette pulls over. It's like a joke. It's like in polyester when Tab Hunter pulls over to the barn. <laughs> but it was his mom's Corvette, and he was on his way to have lunch at the Subway sandwich shop nearby. He picked me up. He didn't know who I was. He wanted to tell him, never heard of my movies, nothing. And he drove me He's to Ohio. Old, right? He just drove me to Ohio. We just kept talking. And his parents were concerned. And... Uh, and then he dropped me up. We had a great time. And then he kept texting me the rest of the way saying, I'm going to come get you joking. And I got stuck in places that took a long time. And it was like four or five days later. And he texted me and said, well, and I got a big ride, a good ride through Kansas. And he said, you're kidding. I've been driving 48 hours at 80 miles an hour, and I'm almost caught up to you. And he caught up to me in Denver. And then his parents were really concerned. I said, is there ever Amber <laughs> Alert out for you or anything? Is, am I going to get in trouble here? And then he took me a lot of the way. And then I just gave him the keys to my apartment service. Let's just drive there. I want to get some more real rides. And he was great. It was a completely innocent thing. It was uh, an adventure. I don't. I. I couldn't understand why people said, "Why would he do that?" For an adventure. Well, you know, it was like fun. He was going to get his lunch at the subway. It was more fun than that. It was the beginning of the summer. He got to go across the country. He had a good story. We had a, a conversation. Time. You're the gay liberal famous for a film in which a drag queen eats dog excrement. Yeah. So what did you talk about all those hours on the road with a religious Tea Party Republican? Well, I, he, I don't know how religious he was. Um, he, We talked about everything, about... Uh, about his life, about women, about men, about humor, about what San Francisco was like, about, uh, I don't know, we just had a great time. It was very much like father and son in a weird way, but swingers tried to pick us up, a carload of swingers kept <laughs> texting that. him. And I said, you gave him your phone number? Yeah, I said, <laughs> and he was naive in some ways, and then he would blush when they would you know, say to him, like, hey, let's get together, I thought. And then we checked in this one motel, and the maitre d' kept trying to hit on him, ringing his bell in the middle of the night, <laughs> bringing him the gift basket. I said, you're supposed to bring me the gift basket. <laughs> yeah. What's up with this? But he didn't know what a gift basket was. He was totally confused by it. So, And, and then he was so confused, he locked himself outside the <laughs> so then I had to go down. And it was weird, you know, in Reno, when you check in, they don't ask the person you're with for any ID or anything. Well, they just write on their trick. You know, I, <laughs> to me, it was so shocking. Of course, we had separate rooms. But, but uh, you know, I'm amazed that they don't ask for ID or anything. Really, it was amazing. Well, his mother kept calling him all the time, and you kept imagining that she would be Googling you and becoming more and more distant. Well, it's did not good to Google out, me. Did, yeah. you ever find out, did you ever find out if she really did Google you? Well, I know that they kept saying, "Is that the? How do you know it's him?" And then once I heard him say, "What do you mean? Who is it? It's your son." She thought I had answered the phone, <laughs> pretending I was him, and he was locked in the trunk. Now I don't blame his mom and dad for being a little concerned, but at the same time, I kept saying to him, "Well, let me talk to him." And he would never let me. So I figured that was his business. He was over eighteen. You know, it was nothing going on in any way sketchy, except that we ran away together <laughs> in this ridiculous trip that was like a reality show suddenly, but no one was filming. But I always thought that in the beginning, if I ever did get a scary ride, I had always planned to say, you know, I'm shooting a reality show, and there's a satellite filming this right now, <laughs> and if you leave, the, the camera won't be able to follow you. And I think that might have worked. It probably would have yeah, worked in today's worked. NSA environment. Yeah. It probably it could be true. true. It probably would have right. worked. This kid sounded like he was pretty open-minded. That cannot always be said for people on either side of the political spectrum, including on the left. Is there something, in your view, to the charge of liberal intolerance that we hear these days? Well, I think oh, liberals can be just as fascist as, as Republicans. And um, I, I've seen that because um, I have an assistant who's Republican. And, of course... All the liberal friends I know when they have a conversation, they never assume anyone else could possibly not agree with them. So they talk as if that no one ever, that is fascism. In a way. Now, I think Republicans do the same thing when they have all Republican friends. But to me, if you can't listen to somebody else, you want, you want to change their mind, make them laugh. That's you, the only way people will ever stop and listen. You have talked about this in gay culture, what you call gaily correctness. Gaily incorrect, which I am a lot, because I joke now when I go to all the colleges, we have enough gay people. I, I want people to come in. <laughs> we have enough. I think you have to audition now. You really. gotta, you you gotta, have a panel of perverts where you get gay ID. You have to get qualifications to yes, get in the club yeah, now. It's not a numbers game. 
it's John Waters and he's discriminating. His latest book is called John Waters, Carsick, John Waters Hitchhikes Across America. He joins us in studio. You can see the live video stream at our website, kojoshow.org. Here is Tom in Baltimore, Maryland. Tom, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. I noticed that in, in Hairspray, um, and, and something that I observed myself, was some of the bigotry that was shown uh, by the people involved with the Buddy Dean show and, and some of the prejudice about letting black kids on, on the show. Was that done intentionally in the movie? Because if it was, you did it very well. Well, it, it, what really happened in Hairspray was exaggerated. I gave it a happy ending. Uh, but really, the Buddy Dean show went off the air because it wouldn't integrate. And I don't think that was Buddy. I think it was the station management. Um, the Milk Grant show here was not integrated. Uh, American Bandstrand was not integrated. It wasn't anywhere. And the kids were fine with it. The odd irony was that they listened to all black radio and all black music. And the only black people who were allowed on the show was they actually called it Negro Day. Or the entertainers could come on and lip sync their song, but they could, of course, never dance with a white person. So this was actually the norm then. So um, I, I wanted to point that up and show that, uh, it, and is it so odd today if if, if, kid, if there was a teen dance show on today and kids still slow dance, which they won't, could black and white kids slow dance together at 14 on television today? I, I'm not so sure. Good question. Thank you very much for your call, Tom. We'll see if someone chooses to answer that question with a reality show. You were picked up at one point by an indie rock band. Here we go, Magic. They yep. recognized you. They tweeted about it. Those tweets went viral. It's my understanding that you taught those kids some subculture terms that were new to them, including trend sexual. Well, trend sexual is a lot of times women that want to be gay but aren't, and they pretend they are for a straight guy, which I think is heresy. I think make them do it then. <laughs> uh, there's a blouse. That's my favorite word. That's that's yeah. a feminine top. Uh, oh yeah, I get this. It's a bear I term. This. Right? I get this. Yes, yes, yes. Um, according to the Spin Magazine piece, when you when they recognized you and turned around and came back, they said, "Get in, sir." I always freak out when people call me sir these days because well, I, I think of myself in that. I don't either, but so, and they didn't mean this, but also I hear people say that in the S&M world, which is really makes me freak out <laughs> because I'm not going to about take out a whip and hit them or something. Uh, but that is S&M talk a lot, too. I think they were just being very respectful to me. And I am a filth elder, so, I, so I'm used to that when people treat me with that kind of very, very reverence. It's very sweet of them and very nice. And when, they're, they, when I get in a car, as long as the ride they gave me, they can call me anything they want. Not only the pictures of you taken by various rides or various of your hosts go viral, at one point you discover a pirated tote bag with a picture of one of your hitchhiking signs on sale for 19.99. Yeah, a day after it was online of, of a picture of me with a hitchhiking bag that was tweeted from the rock band. That shocked me. And they didn't even send me one. And, and, and this was even before you finished your journey. Oh, yeah. It was before I finished the movie. It was like I was instantly marketed by somebody that it was called a hitchhiking tote, and it had my I-70 West sign on it. And they were smart enough not to reproduce mine. They they sort of did it themselves, so it wasn't even like my stolen handwriting. I thought it was fine. It just shocked me, kind of. You imagine various songs playing during your rides, including some well-known and some very obscure, everything from Marvin Gaye to Nervous Nervous. How do you create this playlist? Well, I have people that I've worked with on all the soundtracks of my movies, a guy named Larry Beneshevitz who I work with, and also I like this kind of music. I have this kind of music, and I would go online and look up hitchhiking songs, you know, and, and I love novelty songs. I like weird, these are oldies but good as you never heard of before, believe me, I haven't heard of them, so they're really obscure. And most hitchhiking songs are kind of Western, except for the most famous one by Marvin Gaye, which is Rhythm and Blues, Hitchhike. But most all hitchhiking ones are country songs. And of course, these are. This is the playlist that accompanies the book Carsick. On now to Dave, in Reston, Virginia. Dave, your turn. Hey, how you doing? I'm well. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for for being one of the directors that brought me into kind of the indie side of movies. But that aside, uh, I have a quick hitchhiking story. I'll say it pretty briefly. A buddy of mine and I are, are going up 81. I've got a bassoon. My friend's got his guitar. And we're heading up north to Syracuse area. And this guy picks us up. We get in the car. He takes off like a bat out of hell, maybe, you know, 90 miles an hour. The car is shaking, and he, he starts eating pills and drinking beer. He has a 12-pack. Oh. And we don't think much of it. 
So this guy says to us, uh, you know, that he's on leave from the VA mental hospital, and that he got the car from uh, his friends in the pen, who oh. picked it up for him. And then he pulls over to the side of the road. We don't know what's going on. I'm kind of, I'm the bassoon player, so I'm kind of shaking in my boots. Uh, he gets out and he just starts pissing on on oncoming traffic, <laughs> and pissing and pissing, and he yells, "I got a purple heart!" Oh. So, we stay in the car, get to Wilkesbury, Virginia. Get you didn't get out? You didn't get out at oh, that point? All right. At that point, you know you know when you're around somebody you're unsure of, yeah. sometimes you just think saying put is better than Yeah, me. you're right. Plus you had a ride. So, so yeah, we got in. We went to this bar in Wilkesbury. He came in with us, and, and she asked for I, a lady, asked for I, IDs from both of me and my buddy, and then asked for his. He pulled out his purple heart and slapped it on the bar, and it was just a great moment. Oh. And then that, you, you left the ride there. <laughs> yeah, we had reached our destination temporarily. Yeah, and you never, as your next ride, saw the car upside down along the highway <laughs> in flames. I, I, I would not be surprised one bit, but I, actually I think this guy was maybe a bit of a savant. Yeah, you know, I never saw one car accident the entire way, and I never had one bad driver, which was amazing because I am a backseat driver. And I always thought that's going to be really uncomfortable. I say, hey, slow down, pull over. <laughs> Dave, thank you very much for your call. That was a good story. Hitchhiking across the country may not be a scientific study, but people will want to know exactly what did you take from this about Americans in America today? Well, I believe in the basic goodness of people. I've always said that, and it was proven correctly to me. I, I didn't have a bad ride. Uh, everybody went out of their way to help me uh, for whatever reason it was. And uh, that we got a lot of space in this country. There is room for people. All these people that are saying we're the borders and nobody can come to this country. Why? We have plenty of room. Well, a lot of that room is in motels. And after this trip, you got to know your <laughs> motels pretty oh. well. What was the best and worst of that experience? Days in, I'd get my vote as the best. They had good lighting. A Holiday in the very worst. I mean, really, you can't read even one thing in a Holiday <laughs> Inn room. The lighting is it bad. because it's supposed to be so romantic? You know, not everybody goes for a weekend of Eros in the Holiday Inn, believe me, on Route 70. And they just had the worst food, too, I think. Uh, days in, I would say, was the best of all. Really? Yeah. What surprised me for all the highs and lows, it seems hitchhiking is in reality tedious much of the time. Incredibly. Have you had enough of hitchhiking for one lifetime? Well, you doing I like hitchhiking dates. It's a good thing to say, you want to come hitchhike with me to the beach, and it's kind of romantic and sexy to go on a hitchhiking trip with somebody. I think that's a good date. But uh, for real, I would never hitchhike across the country again. I don't have to do it. You know, I, I know what it's like, but I do know that I can always do it in a time of any kind of emergency when you're stuck, that I, I would not be afraid to do it. Let's get another hitchhiking story from Gretchen in Washington, D.C. Gretchen, what's your story? Hi, Mr. Waters, big fan of you in Baltimore. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Um, my story is about, I was a while ago, I was, at a, I was working at a Clinton inauguration event, and it was in one of those arenas outside the Beltway, mm -hmm. and we were coming out at 2.30 in the morning, and lots of cars and limos, and I saw this person hitchhiking by the road. I thought, well, that's weird. So I stopped and I asked him, where are you going? He says, I'm going back to Washington. And so he went, I need to get my mother. So I was thinking, well, what if this is like a mass murder type of person, blah, 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 which did not make any sense. Uh, but I still thought about it. So he gets his mother and they, um, she gets him into the house. She's wearing a fur coat. I'm still thinking about the mass murder story, <laughs> and, which is, again, bizarre. So anyway, so we start going and I start talking to him. It comes out that he's a Jesuit. And uh, I could not see his collar because it was winter and, you know, we're wearing coats and so forth. So we're talking and talking and talking. And it dawns on me that I'm talking to the president of Georgetown University at the time. <laughs> his name was Father Leo something. Very, very nice time. You know, so I take him all the way to university and, uh, and we say goodbye. And he had asked me a question on the way. And the next day I get a call from my husband. It tells me um, we have tickets here for Hoya game. Uh, courtesy of Father Leo, he wants us to come on X and X date. So anyway, I thought that was a sweet. Uh, well, but why was he hitchhiking? The vow of poverty? <laughs> no, I don't know. I think he's been as a group, and I think somehow he lost his group in the crowd. But he was there with his elderly mother and the fur coat and everything, and he was not a mass murderer, which is a good thing. Yeah. Th well, but you know, you never can tell they're mass murderers. Believe me, all the no, people that got him with Ted Bundy didn't know it, right? 
Thank you very much for your call. One of the things you have to do when you're hitchhiking is not only make conversation, you have to listen. You like listening. Yeah, I'm a good listener, and um, you have to listen because people don't pick up hitchhikers that don't want to talk in any way. They, they're they interested in you, but they need somebody to talk to, too, and they've all survived something. They've all gotten through something, which I love a survivor. I like somebody that's beaten, you know, gone down and gotten back up, and it seems they, all people that pick up hitchhikers have done that. Maybe it was their childhood. Maybe they had a drug problem or a liquor problem at one point, but they've all gone beyond that, so they want to help other people. They do, and they really mostly did think I was just a homeless man, especially I had this hat that said Scum of the Earth, which was a movie title which I should have never worn. That was a really <laughs> stupid choice of a fashion accessory because you couldn't see it from the side of the road. But in the morning in the breakfast area when I would be trying to make eye contact and people saw Scum of the Earth, it didn't make them invite you to get in the front seat especially. And you can't, I guess, be a really moody hitchhiker. You can't go into someone's car, someone who wants to talk, and maintain a stony silence. No. They, they won't take you very far. Or worse, look at your Blackberry, look at your, run your business, and take phone calls about you. No, you have to be kind of in a good mood. And, 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 and they're going to ask you what the trip's been like. And I would say I was writing a book, but I had a sign once that said writing a hitchhike book. No one stopped because their privacy. They think, what kind of book? Maybe I don't want to be in your book. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it puts people off. Got to take a short break. If you have calls, stay on the line. We'll try to get to your calls. If the lines are busy, you can shoot us an email to code you at wamu.org. Do you have a favorite Baltimore neighborhood? We'll talk a little bit about Baltimore when we come back. Are you a fan of cult movies like Pink Flamingos? 800-433-8850. You can send us a tweet at Kojo Show or go to our website, kojoshow.org. Enjoy the live video stream or ask a question, make a comment. I'm Kojo Namdi. <laughs> Our guest is John Waters. His latest book is called Carsick, John Waters Hitchhikes Across America. He's a filmmaker, actor, and best-selling author, well-known for the film and Broadway musical Hairspray, as well as movies like Serial Mom and Pink Flamingos. John, we got a tweet from Sarah who says, As a Baltimore native, I love that John Waters shows the world a, vers a version of Baltimore that isn't out of the wire. People associate your name with Baltimore. You set your yeah. films there, and although you ha also have homes in New York and San Francisco, you consider Baltimore home. What's compelling to you about Charm City? Because it has, Baltimore has such a great sense of humor about itself. The people there are not impressed. They're not trendy. It's still cheap. It's the only place left in the world where you can get an amazing real estate deal. It's cooler than ever, I think. It's, we got edge. And I love The Wire. She said, not like The Wire. The Wire is part of Baltimore. The same way my movies are, the same way Barry Levinson's are. They're all a part of Baltimore. Each part is made up of extreme things. But Baltimore, to me, is the sense of humor. 
you were good friends with David Simon, the creator of The Wire. You yeah. married him and his wife. You say that The Wire portrayed precisely one side. Of sure, Baltimore. one side. There is. It is an exaggeration. You you think Pink Flamingos is an exaggeration? Come to Baltimore. You'll see people that look like the vine standing right on the <laughs> on the corner. And my friend said, "Why in Baltimore do people dance at bus stops?" <laughs> they always do. You see people waiting for the bus dancing. Even what do you take people when you show them around? Baltimore? Oh, all over. I can. T I take them to the Wire neighborhood. I take them to East Baltimore. I take them to Hamden, which is great. It's hillbillies and hipsters mixing together. What of Baltimore? Do you still really like? Because Baltimore is undergoing something of a transformation. What of the Baltimore that you know and love that is still there? And what do you think may be lost with gentrification? I don't think it's that gentrified. I think, yes, there are some neighborhoods that have some of those places, but they need those neighborhoods, or otherwise it would just die. So I'm not against the gentrification of parts of Baltimore. To me, Hamden's the perfect example. It's old school, kind of redneck in a great way, but at the same time, they are great restaurants there, but they're not pretentious. I hate it when people try to, quote, act rich in Baltimore. Please, let's, let's, let's celebrate how great we are and how original we are. We don't do rich that well. Baltimore is also attracting young people, artists, musicians. What's the draw of Charm City for this new generation? So the music scene there is amazing with Dan Deacon and Beach House. There's so many great groups because it's cheap and there's Bohemia there. That's why you can afford to live there. And I think there's a real Bohemia there, which almost in every other city, it's too expensive to have Bohemia. Well, you know, given the cost of housing in Washington and how it's rising. I love the phrase you use in Baltimore. Baltimore still makes a dollar holler. Makes a dollar holler. It can. Jean Hill said that. The great actress that was in one of my movies unfortunately died last year. She said, we know how to make a dollar holler. We got an email from Richard in D.C. I saw you in Chicago for the 20th anniversary of Pink Flamingo screened along with Mondo Trasho. I've seen and loved each iteration of Hairspray. Cannot imagine my cultural life growing up gay from the 1960s to now without John Waters. Big thanks. We also got a tweet from Kelly who said, I listened to the first five minutes of the interview. I'm buying the book right now. <laughs> oh, wow. That's good. Good. Thank you. <laughs> and I don't think it'll disappoint you because um, I think you'll laugh when you read the book. Hopefully. Hopefully. And it's a page turner. There's, it, and it's like, if you like my early movies, the first parts are very much like them. Every one of these characters seems like they escape from a can <laughs> in my house of a film can. It is certainly a page turner. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, I actually abandoned the NBA Finals <laughs> to, to, to continue reading this book. You have there said, is a blurb. <laughs> <laughs> you've said that your rejection of all things proper and tasteful is a result of your upbringing. What was your childhood in Baltimore like, and what were you into as a Full of good taste. You know, my parents taught me the tyranny of good taste, and, and I'm glad I know it, because you can't have fun with bad taste unless you know the rules. And my mother certainly did tell us the rules of good taste. And uh, and I actually think today that I do have good taste. I, I You can't use bad taste for humor without knowing having good taste so to me i never am mean-spirited i look up to the things i make fun with and that's why i don't like reality television because it asks you to feel superior to the people that you're watching i never do that i hope i don't think the I do. judges all do yeah, but I, you know, to me, I don't get reality television. Just walk outside. In Baltimore, you are in reality. This trip of hitchhiking across the country was a reality show. You should make your own reality show, not watch somebody others. I get the impression that, I don't know, growing up and throughout adulthood, you have always internally been kind of a happy person. Well, I, I never wanted to be like everybody else, really. And my parents were made me feel safe. That's the only job a parent really has. And no matter how nuts you are, if your parents have made you feel safe, I think you work out your neuroses eventually to have a fairly happy and productive life. But you can't always get that. It's not fair. Life isn't fair. So so um, if you're young and you've had been dealt a really bad hand, you can bitch about it till you're 30. <laughs> and I think by 30, you've got to, you know, this is it. Too bad. You know, you got to get over it. Get out of my basement. Um, here is Jaina in Rockville, Maryland. Jaina, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, John. This is Jana Panathan. And um, I, I'm currently living in Gaithersburg, Maryland. But I am the aunt of Joshua Grinnell, a.k.a. Peaches Christ. Peaches Christ is a, not only a great performer, a really good producer in San Francisco. And I just had to call and say hello because through um, Joshua, we have all become John Waters fans. 
And uh, I have to tell you that one time I went to the Kennedy Center, they were showing uh, in a small theater um, a movie. And, you know, to be honest, I don't remember if the movie was about you or Divine, but I remember seeing your parents speak in that movie. Right. And it, it just really struck me. They were fantastic, and I totally hear what you, you're saying about them making you feel safe because they, they, they were so proper. But you could tell that they loved you and they were supportive of you, and that was just so cool. Yeah, I think they knew. What else could I do? Was this be this or prison? So they might as well embrace the film career, even though the films I made were horrifying to them and embarrassed them very much in the beginning. But they paid for it, and I paid them all back, too. I paid them back every penny. So it was a very good relationship I had with my parents. It took me a long time of being an adult to realize that. But now that I look back on it, I think how incredibly loving they were in a very difficult child that I was. Jenna, thank you very much for your call. We got an <clears throat> email from Corey who says, 70s Italian horror movies, John, Walter, John Waters and John Cage showed me that beauty and art was everywhere and had nothing to do with taste, intellectualism, class, or money. I went from being an uptight, classical music obsessed elitist to a man who loves desperate living drag queens and thrift store crap. <laughs> oh, how the mighty tumble. Uh, well, that means you're a, you're a trash elitist, which I'm for, too. I am, too. There's nothing a matter, matter with elitist people if they have a reason to be elitist. If you are smarter than anybody in the whole world, if you just thought up the best movie, I don't mind that you're an elitist. I just have problems with elitists for no apparent reason. Let's talk about movies for a second, because you say writing books for you now is much better in terms of making a liver, living than making independent films. What has it, What is it that has made it so much more difficult to make independent films? The collapse of the DVD market, which was That's the what entire, I didn't quite understand. Can you explain that? The entire DVD market was the profit. And now no one buys it. It's over. They don't make computers now. They don't even have DVD things in Correct. it. That and the global business to China, which is they just want tent pole movies that cost $100 million that have no movie stars in it, really, and no special effects, just all special effects. You don't even need subtitles. So, And the last thing they want is a comedy. That is the most uncommercial international movie you can make today because what's funny in each country is radically different. What's scary is in it, what's frightening, what's sexy. But what's funny is really varied. In, in and especially art. in your case, where you de where you depend so much on wit. Well, they don't want wit. That's what that's what the, the last thing that they're looking for. And I hope, if I've ever been successful, that that is what I'm using. On to Ed in Washington D.C. Ed, you're on the air with John Waters. Go ahead, please. Oh, Ed, my fault. Here you are, Ed. Okay. Are you there now? Yes, I am. You How go? you doing, Kojo and I'm John? Good. Hi, John. Thank you for the memories. Thank you for the memories. All the wonderful work you've done. Uh, it just it just brings some bright spots in my life. I'm thinking back to the first time I I saw some of your flicks, and uh, thanks thanks for all that. But you know, I saw you on Craig Ferguson. I heard you with Terry on Fresh Air, and boy, I am just chomping at the bit to get that book. Thank you very much. Thank you. They're, those are good shows. I've done both those shows many 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 times. Thank you very. Yeah. Yeah, and I've, I've, I've had great experiences hitchhiking myself back in college days, back in the early 70s, pitching, you know, Thanksgiving night from Buffalo, New York, down to Dallas. Why don't you Probably try it again now, this summer? Well, you know, this summer it may be a little bit tough, you know, family man and all that, but I will try Take your children with you. <laughs> sure. You could have a whole new reality show yeah. all of your own, yeah. Ed. Thank you much for your call. You've had a huge in influence on underground culture, um, but popular culture has shifted dramatically in the decades since Pink Flamingos came out. Outrageous and shocking are almost the norm now. Do you think everyone else caught up with where you were back in the 70s? Well, I, I don't, I'm not going to say that. I think I had an influence in some ways, but now the big budget Hollywood comedies are about bad taste, so mm -hmm. it's not so transgressive anymore, and a lot of times they don't use wit, and it isn't funny. But some of them are. I mean, like The Hangover started, whenever you have one thing that works, you're going to have 50 bad copies of it, which is what Hollywood always does. So um, I could name a lot of bad ones, but there's some good ones. So I'm not, I'm not um, it, it is what America imports now in humor is the kind of movies that I used to make, at least that. But then you have Johnny Knoxville, who I think is the most like in spirit that we were like when we were young making movies. But his movies make $100 million, which good for him. 
Even in films like Pink Flamingos, though, it seems the point was never shock value alone. The filthiest people alive somehow came off as, well, a likable family. Can you talk a little bit about what you wanted to say about American culture? I wanted to say it was, I know it's out of context, but that was the year Deep Throat came out, pornography had became illegal, and it was a joke on what can't you do anymore. And the ending of that movie, there was not a law against that. Today there is, even in the porn world, but I certainly did, we never did it for sexual reasons, but today that is the only thing that's illegal, really. And uh, so it was a publicity stunt in a way. But you're right. The, the filthiest people alive were, leaving, were living a nice life with their oddball family in retirement. And they were attacked by jealous people that, that, that wanted to social climb in the world of filth. So, um, yes, the morals of the film are the same as Hairspray. Don't judge other people. David in Washington, D.C., you're on the air. David, go ahead, please. Hi. Um, I saw John. I saw you on uh, the Bill Maher show about a week or so ago. And I was surprised that no one commented at all on your suit. <laughs> well, it's not a, you know, maybe if I did RuPaul, they would comment on it. You know, uh, it, it was by Izzy Miyake, that suit. It's a good one, yeah. Yeah, it was well built in the sense that, you know, the patterns match right and left and all that. Well, they don't Just really curious, match. That's the you... point of that suit. They don't match. <laughs> well... <laughs> I was just curious. Do you have to pay a lot for the outrageous suits that you uh, typically or often wear? You heard it's a designer suit. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but you need all the help you can get at my age. When I was young, I would get the worst thing in the bottom of a Value Village bin that hadn't been sold for two years and then carry my own crayon, cross it off, and mark it down myself, which was half shoplifted. The Value Village bin. I've been there, and I saw that suit on Bill Maher. That was very, very good looking. John Waters, filmmaker, actor, best-selling author. His latest book is called Carsick. John Waters, Hitchhikes Across America. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was fun. And thank you all for listening. I'm Kojo Namdi. Thank you.